All right, we're here. We are here to finish this demo disc off. Of course, not just the game demos and videos. These PS2 demo discs came with a lot of extra shit. Oh, a Kinetica download. I'm not going to be download. <laughs> it's the wrong terminology. I'm not going to be saving any of these because I don't have either Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 or Kinetica. I'd gotten off the Tony Hawk bandwagon on the PS2. Uh, it just wasn't doing anything for me. Behind the scenes. Now this is where the interesting stuff comes from. Blood Omen 2. Step back in time, my friends, to fight for your life. For Kane rises again. You've met the challenges of Soul Reaver and Blood Omen. Now you will face even bigger challenges in Blood Omen 2. Blood Omen 2 is kind of Kane rediscovering himself in many ways. Where Kane is kind of introduced to a rude awakening early on in the game and kind of has to ascend to power once again. Kane has been resurrected by the few remaining vampires that are alive in Nazgoth, and uh, they need him to infiltrate the Seraphim, try to figure out who the Seraphim Lord is, what is this new magic he's using to kill all the vampires, and try to overthrow him and regain his conquest of uh, Nazgoth. In a world of darkness, it's hard to tell who is on the side of the just and who is a force for evil. Such is the case with Kane. One of the great things about the Legacy of Kane universe is it's not so clear cut who's the good guys, who's the bad guys. There are characters who you may paint as the bad guy and all of a sudden you then realize that this guy is actually doing something which is a benefit to somebody else. Kane himself yeah, is that's how you want to put it. Everything he does is about what's best for Kane at that time, regardless of whether it's seen as a good thing by the world or an evil thing by those around him. Cain himself is not necessarily a good guy trying to defend the common man. Cain has this very, very clear set of goals of taking over Nazgoth and turning the world to his will. One day my people would know me again for their lord, but the vampires who were traitors to their kind would know me first of all. You will enter this world in a weakened state, and you will have to use all your cunning to grow strong once again. Kane actually begins the game stripped of most of his former powers. He retains the ability, or some aspect of the ability, to hide himself in mist. Therefore, he's out of the range of most human senses. Later on, you'll also get the charm ability, where you target another character in the game, and then when you activate it, you actually get inside their head, and the camera moves behind them, and now you control that person. And Kane himself will have to actually defeat bosses who are powerful in that particular dark gift. It's a long video. But your dark gifts alone will not be enough to ensure You kind of don't want to talk over it too much. Also learn to arm yourself. When Kane sees a, a thief or a thug or a knight uh, with a weapon that he wants, he can take that weapon from him, now he's got it. There's a large variety of weapons that Kane can pick up. He can pick up a dagger, or he can pick up a sword, or axes, and you know he'll exchange them for other weapons as he needs them. We decided to implement a feature whereby the weapons could be broken because we didn't want to focus on players being able to, for instance, button mash so that they could get off a whole series of moves without being punished, and that the combat system will actually reward people to skillfully decide when was the right time to defend or attack. It also helps us display just how powerful Kane's strikes in the world are, that you can shatter a weapon upon an enemy. You may believe yourself an expert in combat. How wrong you will be. This is a different world that you must master. The combat system for Blood Omen 2 is very, very different from Blood Omen 1. We, uh, we really wanted to go with something that showed off Kane's strength as a vampire. So what we let Kane do is when we get into a one-on-one -on -one combat with a character, Kane can circle around them. You have to time your blocks to characters' attacks. The swords will actually meet up as they're supposed to, so it's really, really cool. For the most part. <laughs> it's actually something impressive in its day. The way that that worked, the blocking uh, animations Kane's, and stuff. Uh, strength and power. We also let Kane grab other characters. If he can get inside their attacks, he can actually grab them by the neck, lift them up. He's got a weapon. He can do really mean things to them and toss them away. 
One thing we've tried to retain for the player is uh, a maximum amount of actions they can You playing this on a Dreamcast? The amount of button presses. And so whenever an enemy is attacking Kane, all they need to do is to press the defense or the block button. And we'll actually arrange so that it's perfectly choreographed that Kane will actually intercept the weapon as it's about to land on him. And so it's actually something whereby the player's getting a variety of spectacular style moves, but with the minimum amount of uh, actual control confusion. Then Kane can also dodge to the side uh, around the person to try to get away from the attack. Now, some of the attacks your opponents have are unblockable, and they're, they have a very special graphic to, to sort of communicate to the player that you can't block this attack, you have to just get out of the way. Generally, only the, the larger, stronger enemies have those types of attacks. It is a mysterious set of forces that controls your fate. You would be wise to learn about them carefully and harness their power. Glyph technology is something that's very mysterious to the world at the beginning of the game. It's kind of similar to electricity in some ways that people know it's there, but they don't always know what it's about, how it actually works. You flip switches, you, and the glyph energy travels across a, a glyph line. Overthinking a that a little bit. And it does something that, that cool, opens a door. That's kind of a mechanic uh, in the game. There's no real story stone, component, I don't does whatever. think. The Seraph and I have been employing it for things such as ward gates. And you can imagine them as metal detectors for vampires, so the humans can pass straight through them. But any time a vampire nears, it begins to glow, and eventually if the vampire tries to cross such a portal, they'll be repelled, and all the guards in the world around will know that that person was a vampire. <laughs> In playing game, beware, or you too can fall victim to his spell. I think vampires are something that has always been kind of on the edges of being invoked. It's always mysterious, it's seductive. For some people it's erotic, perhaps. I don't think it's anything that particularly comes in and out of fashion. It's just always have a presence. Kane's the most recognized bad guy in video games, and he's really cool, and people love playing him. All right, so I had tried to play a demo for another one of the Legacy of Kane games, Soul Reaver 2, when going through the demo portion of this, and it just didn't load. But we're talking about Blood Omen 2. These two games came out at around about the same time. Uh, Blood Omen 2, you know, I'd say it's probably the most divisive game in the series. It's People say it's the worst game in the series, and you know, that's probably true. But I'd say it's not really a bad game. I played through it when it was new, and then I sat it aside, and I played through it again years later when I off for this channel. There's a whole playthrough the entire Legacy of Kane series on this channel. But when playing through it for the sake of making videos, I had come to the same conclusion that I did back when I played it originally, is that the game knows exactly how long it should be. And that's a rare gift in games at all, especially modern games. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It knows it's, it knows how long its gameplay loop will be sustainable for it. It's not too short, it's not too long. <laughs> Strangest thing that that's the best thing I can say about it, that it, it doesn't overstay its welcome, but it's actually like surprisingly difficult to find a game that does that. As far as like its narrative significance, it kind of fucked everything up for the Legacy of Kane series because the idea behind it is the idea behind the entire series was Kane is turned into a vampire and he goes through his journey on in the first Blood Omen game and then thousands over a thousand years later you have Soul Reaver and then after Soul Reaver the game Soul Reaver was supposed to end the series but they ended up cutting a lot of content for it and left a sort of a cliffhanger at the end. So they started working on two games at once, so they had Blood Omen 2 and Soul Reaver 2. 
Soul Reaver 2, or Blood Omen 2, took itself, placed itself in the timeline in a rather strange place, which was before the uh, before Soul Reaver, but after the original Blood Omen. In that place, Kane initiates a sort of like a vampire takeover of the world, and he gets defeated, and then wakes up a couple hundred years later to rebuild his empire. The problem is it, that doesn't really fit in the timeline well. It doesn't make any sense. He has a vampire army, but at the end of Blood Omen, he's the only vampire left. It's actually a significant aspect of the story that Kane is the only vampire left in the world. And he has to rebuild, and he takes Raziel, and he takes Duma, and all the others, and, and goes on his crusade. Blood Omen 2 creates an entire new vampire army and population out of nowhere. Characters like Vordor are miraculously resurrected, and no explanation is ever given. So that meant that Soul Reaver 2, which came out at about the same time, had to jump through hoops trying to trying to rationalize all of the continuity errors that Blood Omen 2 created. And it wasn't until the end of Defiance, which was the game, the follow-up game to those two, that they finally managed to close the majority of those plot holes. It's kind of, as far as also, like, the characterization of Kane as well, is a little bit different, because the way he was portrayed in the first game, as well as Soul Reaver 2 and Defiance, he had this kind of, like, Shakespearean-esque pretentious speech to him, which is toned down way far in Blood Omen 2. The voice acting, uh, Simon Templeman, the guy who voices Kane, does an, an incredible job in all of the games, but in Blood Omen 2, the way he speaks, his speech patterns, the, the kind of things that he would say, it's not as weirdly unrealistic as it is in the other games. And that's actually a bad thing, because he had a certain, both him and Raziel had this way of talking that was unrealistic. People don't talk the way that they do in real life, but it sort of adds a kind of mystique about them, because it's such an unusual way of speaking. It comes across as almost Shakespearean, and it doesn't feel natural, but it actually suits them because they are supernatural creatures, you know. Anyway, let's move on. PlayStation 2 truck team, was that? Was that the, was that the tour? Travel around the country from rock festivals to racing events. That they did? To the Super Bowl. And best of all, you got paid for it. Well, if that sounds good to you, meet the guys from the PlayStation 2 touring attraction. My name is Stacy Greer. I live in Meadowview, Virginia, and I drive the PlayStation. Yes, yeah, a guy named Stacy. United States. My name is Zach Stanfield. I'm 25. I'm from Georgia. I um, work on the PlayStation 2 touring attraction. You sound like you're My from Georgia. My name is Gustavo Regara. I am the tour manager of the PlayStation 2 touring attraction. And we're on Bourbon Street, baby. That's right, the PlayStation Touring Attraction is a 68-foot-long, 22-wheel truck jam-packed with over 30 PlayStation 2 consoles featuring the hottest new games. So how does one get a job this good? I was drafted straight out of college, number one pick. Zach Stanfield at the University of Georgia? No, not really. I knew someone in the company. I met the guys that were on a smaller truck, and they told me that the big truck, there were some positions coming up in. So I went to the <laughs> marketing company before the job was really even open up. Well, I guess it's just a matter of being in the right place at the right time. Since this sounded like such a cool job, we decided to hang out with them for a while and find out what a typical day was like. Well, first of all, we bring it in, and Stacy kind of surveys wherever the site is, if it's going to be easy or difficult to get into, if the ground's uneven or not, if there's a dip in the road, things like that. We level it, we open up the walls, hydraulics, lower the floors down, open up the wing walls. Then you take all the kiosks which are bolted in the center, we have to move them out to their locations and bolt them back this down. This kind of crap that in. Sony used to do. Turn the units on, put whatever game we're going to have in that unit in. Once we're on the truck and everything's set up, people just coming in, we're hanging out, making sure, you know, nothing's going wrong with any of the consoles. And how long it took to like set that. up? Just giving away free stuff here and there, stirring up some excitement, having a good time. We wanted to know what the best part of their job is. What's better than being at a rock show for work? Getting paid to go watch a concert. That's good stuff. Who else gets to do that? 
coolest events were uh, for sure Ozfest this past summer. That was Ozfest. incredible because we were <laughs> part of the show. We had all access badges, like like we had rock star passes in Ozfest. So I guess they on the truck, you know, and be like, oh, showed up at uh, anything to go other events to it's drum crazy, up. You know, the things you see, Is that like a PR do, thing? It's just the wildest ever, you know. Oh. Okay. That girl was naked. <laughs> we wondered if they got to meet many celebrities. Yeah, we've gotten a few. We did the NFL experience last year on tour. And that was kind of neat because at each stop, players would come on our truck and sign autographs and play some of the games. Oh, thank you. Next, we caught up with the guys in Monterey at the famous Laguna Seca racetrack for the Shell 300. Here, not only could you see fast-paced racing, but also got a chance to check out some of the other cool attractions. Up oh, the Titanic. <laughs> Then the gang was off on a cross-country trip to the Voodoo Festival in New Orleans, where we found out what they do on their off time. In between the road, I'll just find stuff to do, you know, I'll go rent a boat and go wakeboarding. You know, like here, we're a big old swamp tour today. You know, it's just kind of laid back, it was cool, but at least we got to feel some of like what, you know, what New Orleans is kind of about, you know? While in New Orleans, we got to see what the boys do best, and this is what they do to get the crowd pumped up. Every 15 minutes, we get people on the truck. Zach or myself will welcome them. Uh, play some music, you know. I usually try to warn them when they come in that the louder they are, the more stuff I'll give them. Make some noise right now! Oh, personal <laughs> space. To get a t-shirt or another prize when they come on the truck, we have trivia, questions, we have prize giveaways. Brand new shirt there, buddy. Still got the creases in it. Maybe we'll have a contest, like I was saying. Maybe we'll take a tag tournament or Formula One or something like that. The winner will win a t-shirt. It's two laps. You know, I wonder what year this disc came out. Well, it can't be all fun and games. There must be some downside to their jobs. Being a nomad, I guess. Living out of a suitcase all the time. Having nowhere to go home to at the end of the day. Yes. It's one of the toughest parts. You remember this from our last day. Oh, this girl doesn't want to be on camera. <laughs> it's a good thing you fucking put her in this video. Must have been Halloween. See a jack-o'-lantern. That gets wearing after a while. But I talk to them on the phone all the time, and we keep in touch via email. And every once in a while, during a really cool event, I'll fly maybe a friend or two out, you know, and we'll just party. That's right, these guys are on the road 44 weeks out of the year, but their job is definitely in their blood. Even after a long day of giving stuff away, they just can't stop. Yeah, giving stuff away. The beads at Mardi Gras, that's giving stuff away. <laughs> Alright, that, that's just weird content. That had nothing to do with any actual games. Uh, it is, um, uh, I wonder if... Sony did anything like that for like the PlayStation 3. I, I want to say that they did. Where they did, did this tour looking for cool moves. Okay. Portal Runner. They're still doing Portal Runner? Hi, my name is Jesse with the 3DO Company. And today I'm going to show you a cool move for Portal Runner for the PlayStation 2. In Portal Runner, probably one of the hardest levels to beat is a Dragon Boss level. Today I'm going to show you how to deal a 50% instantaneous damage to the dragon and reduce his health level by half. Let me show you how. So Portal Runner, I did not remember this game existing at all until I ran across it in one of these demo discs. I guess the 3DO company did it. Seems like a lot of effort went into marketing this, but I'm guessing that... It didn't have By the biggest impact because 
you'll be able to generate who's talking about it nowadays that will be helpful for you to destroy the dragon you'd think that in a lot of cases that the developers or the publishers or somebody would know whether a game is going to be a hit based on its quality like oh well okay so we got this game called portal runner 3do companies putting it together they're they're gonna um market the hell out of it because they want to have a big release but they should probably know whether the game is actually good to go <laughs> good enough to be a real hit and highlight the water arrow although i guess there is a little bit of delusion that some developers can have like starfield starfield god there's a lot wrong with that game but you can't convince bethesda of that lightning arrow is what you want to defeat the dragon. Press the triangle button again to scroll through your inventory. Make sure that the lightning arrows are in your inventory. And I guess what they wanted to do was to take this shoot. portal runner girl the now has 50 health. and try to so by using the lightning arrows you'll reduce try the to sort of 50 and be that much closer to create a sort of um, like a I don't know how Sort of like Lara Croft her in a bit. So you had Tomb Raider, which was in its day a pretty good game, but the popularity of that game based on the character of Lara Croft was way in excess of what the game deserved. And maybe that they're trying to do the same thing there, create this character here that they could build an entire series off of. Twisted Metal Black. My name is Saul and I'm a tip writer for Sony Computer. Saul. Today I'm going to show you a cool move for Twisted Metal Twisted Black. Metal Black. Cool move, I'm going to show you how to unlock the hidden character manslaughter within the prison ship level. Let me show you how it's done. I love the original so Twisted the Metal. And I did have a whole lot of experience with the later games in the series. I played a little bit of Twisted Metal 2, but it was years after it released and the game had just become too dated by that point. to form a ramp. Then Twisted Metal 3 and like 4 and Small Brawl and all those were Twisted Metal games. They're just sort of like lost. Wait for an opening. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Drive into the hole of the ship and destroy the control box. This will lower manslaughter for you. Meh. Nah. Now when you go back to the character selection screen... So, Twisted Metal Black available. did kind of revitalize the Twisted Metal series and the car combat genre, which had been... had tapered off. I mean, it was really popular for a while, and you had lots of different games which took advantage of that popularity, but Twisted Metal was the big deal. I'd say Vigilante 8 was probably a better game, but, you know, I think I'm alone in that <laughs> statement. Twisted Metal Black kind of revitalized it. I remember having the twisted version of Twisted Metal Black that worked online with the uh, with the PS2. But again, then Twisted Metal died off, and it got brought back, I think, for a PlayStation 3 game, a fairly late gen PS3 game. But I don't think it really hit with a splash, and we haven't seen another one since. Fire the gas can at the large spheres. And wait for the large sphere to roll all the way down the highway. Dude, you're getting fucked up. Get out of there. <laughs> huh. Now you'll notice that the large sphere has made a large gaping hole within the tunnel. Locate the black cube over here to unlock the elevator level. That's weird. Now you've unlocked the hidden level elevators for the multiplayer mode. Make sure to play that with your friends. There was a lot, uh, like I said before, a bunch of times. There have been a lot My name of is Saul Wool, and I'm a tip writer for Sony Computer Entertainment. 
Today I'm going to show you a cool there movie. are a in lot of Sony in this cool move, I'm uh, show you a intellectual cool properties, franchises, track, whatever you want to call them, Let me show you how it's that going. they've created so over the years the and then just kind of abandoned. I mean, is this Kinetica? That was a first party game, wasn't it? Uh, that Twisted right Metal is one. Warhawk is another. Yeah, I mean, they made a. Deck. There was one Warhawk game on the PS1, and then they the sort of made a Warhawk game on the PS3, and that was it. And it was one of the biggest so releases of the early PlayStation right now, One too. Right back on the main track. Like it was, the, it was actually a fairly big you're deal because right, it was a kind of a. Not only will this short flight simulator kind of thing that you hadn't really it seen also before. You a great opportunity to collect a lot of boost. But you know, it didn't stick around. My name is Saul and I'm a tip rider for Sony. Kinetica. This one I remember it did have a fair bit of hype coming around it. Although in my opinion, it was basically wipeout in a different form. Wipeout, though, was a first-party Sony right game. It was Describe Psygnosis, I think, right made here. Wipeout. And Wipeout and, and Psygnosis did make games for Back other consoles, even track. after it was owned by Sony. As but see, uh, it was no definitely a first-party game. It was just first a first-party Sony game that got released on the friggin' sure Saturn. On each lap, and you're almost I think that's true. I should look that up before committing to that. But Kinetica, that, that had a lot of hype behind it. And I, I don't know if anybody really gave Hi, a shit Jesse with a 3DO company. once it and finally released. A cool move for but as I said before, it's In Godai, you play something Sony Godai. used to do a lot, which was magic of Earth, throw fire, everything fire, at the air. wall and see what, what stuck not know in order to, like, well, Kinetic is just something you threw at the wall. It didn't stick. Play. Oh, well. Let me show you how. Maybe it turned to profit. Maybe it didn't. But Sony at least tried. What am I looking at? I don't even right know what this game, game is. Activating my fire magic while Frame rate on, sucks ass. Up my earth magic, execute that, and while that's going on, I'm activating my final air magic. So during this time, I am now wow. a super ninja, and I can easily defeat somebody who I normally wouldn't be able to. I'm going to have to look this game up, because this looks like a train wreck. <laughs> Go, Godai, Godai, Gotti, Elemental Force. Ah, whatever. Who gives a shit? Celebrity Gamer, who is this? DJ Cubert. The fuck is that? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop some uh, hot takes here. Um, DJ Cubert, and I'm a uh, scratch musician. DJs are not musicians. Plays a turntable like a musical instrument, pretty much improv on turntables and manipulating sounds on vinyl. CDs are cool, but you can't scratch on them. Any sound on vinyl is a is a is a musical instrument to us. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you think so. The octagon is right here. This is the octagon. This is where all the DJs around the world come in recession, kind of like a big jam session. Yeah, my favorite video game would have to be uh, Twisted Metal Black as my favorite video game. I'm just pretty much a Twisted Metal fan, that's just me. Spectre. He's the car that uh, can shoot through walls. She wasn't, Spectre was a guy in the last game, so I don't think I'm uh, kind of different. All-time favorite game is a, a Street Fighter 2. I would have to say I kick everyone's ass Street Fighter. Yeah, I'm the best. So, you know, hands down. <laughs> Everyone in the crew wants to play video games, so it's, it's just take turns. On tours, we, we, sh we usually practice in the hotel rooms, but sometimes we'll pull out the PlayStation and kind of play games, you know, so that's kind of like a, a no-no, but uh, we can't help it. You could turn down the music, but leave the sound effects on, and we just blast what we play. I would love to do a, a fast kind of track for a wipeout. Oh. We're doing okay. a movie called Wave Twisters. It's an animated hip hop graffiti animation. Sid, Garen, and Eric Henry animated, and I did all the music for it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Glad you, uh. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I don't want to say anything too bad about people, because, uh. 
sure this... Okay, whatever. Threads, uh, just merch. Oh. Uh, well, unfortunately, that time has passed. Oh, wow, this is important. And that's it. Okay, well, that was the second half, second, uh, the last third of the official U.S. PlayStation Magazine disc number 55. As we all found out, I don't like DJs, and I played Blood Omen 2. Well, there we have it. At least that's confirmed. <laughs>